to be in God's house today? Man, I am so happy to be in God's house today. Like the psalmist said, I was glad. That word means that I was tickled pink when they told me, let's go to church today. You can go on and be seated. I want to thank the Lord for this opportunity. Thank my big bro, our pastor, for this opportunity to communicate the word of God to you today. We are continuing with our series, The Supernatural Church. And how many are thankful that God provided a place like this? I know that uh, every time we come into a place that others have fought for, given for, bled for, and appreciate all the more. It can be sometimes intimidating. Sometimes we can not understand the price that was paid so we could be in a place like this after some struggle, after some turmoil, after some tears, after some sleepless nights, after some prayer-filled nights because it's like, well, Lord, is the fire alarm in the school going to go off this week? But better yet, the other question is, is our guy who we're depending on to help us turn off the fire alarm going to help us out this week? Is the school going to put us in the cafeteria this week? Or are we going to be in a nice, air-conditioned, quiet theater? See, these are the things that some of the things that we endured over the last three years. And every week, setting up our and tearing down, our team being there faithful, faithful, faithful. And it helps to understand a little bit of what we have endured so we can get to this point. So ju don't judge the point where we are right now. Judge what it took to get to this point. And then further beyond that, where we're going to don't 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 judge see some of us can relate to that don't judge where you came from judge where you're going to don't 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 look so much at where you came from look at where you're going to some of us have come from far distances in the country or the world some of us have come in life far distances that if you were to take the time to tell us your story we would probably be here for a number of hours, if, especially if you included the details. <laughs> We're going to look at uh, one verse today, and that's found in the book of John. So if you have your Bible or your app or your phone, your device, you can go ahead and look into that. And we're going to continue on with our series, The Supernatural Church. Jesus said in John chapter 16, Verse 7, in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence we ask that you would continue to lead and guide and direct, transform and mobilize your people for effectiveness in your kingdom so we could carry Sunday into Monday and all the way to Friday that lives transformed would not just happen here, but Lord, that this would be a launching pad for many lives to be changed in classrooms, in neighborhoods, in living rooms, in boardrooms, in, 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 in job and work projects. And Lord, that we would be careful to give you the glory and the praise because of all these things we ask in the most wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen and amen. Anybody love standing in lines? Waiting in lines? 
at the store, at the bank, when you're out to get ice cream. So my wife and I went to get ice cream last night at our favorite ice cream spot, Gunther's, and there was a line out the front door all the way to New Jersey, or so it seemed. I mean, every time you go to Gunther's in the summertime, there's like 75 people in line, and you're like, by the time we get our ice cream, um, all these other people are going to be upset because their ice cream melted, and it's just going to be a bad situation. So we're there waiting in line to get our ice cream and waiting and waiting and waiting. And it start, started to dawn on me that I can't stand waiting in lines. Why not? Well, because it's in the way of what I would like to get, right? In this case, I wanted to get my ice cream. My favorite, in case you feel so inclined to bless me one day, is their banana shake. Love it. Love it. I got a witness. Amen. I can testify to that, sir. I have been getting that banana shake since I was, I don't know, nine years old, ten years old. So for you math whizzes, that's uh, a long time ago. Anyway, so I was there, and I said, I can't stand get, waiting in lines. And neither can anyone of us, I realize, and that's why you see people fidgety. You know, you don't want to stand in line because at the store there might be crying babies. There might be crying adults. There might be crying cashiers. You know, there might be crying just crazy people. There might be the, the, that one cashier. You know, you ever encounter that one cashier who thinks that the customer in front of them is the only customer who exists in the world? No? Okay. Well, when you go to the store or bank or whatever, you will encounter that one teller or cashier who is sharing his entire life story with that one customer in front of you, and you're in a hurry. You're like, you've been with that one customer for like 15 minutes. And this is the express lane where you're only supposed to have seven items. I counted. You have like 13 items. But that cashier is so nice that he let you stand in this line and carry a 20-minute conversation. I'm in a hurry. My wife used to make fun of me back in the day when we first got married about 11 years ago because she would always ask me, do you ever go to the store? And I would start to break down to her the reasons why I, unless it comes down to it, then I will not go to the store. So she would see these Amazon boxes show up and she's like, don't you want to go to the store? I mean, there's interaction, and you get to see interesting people. I'm like, if I wanted to see interesting people, I would go sit in the middle of Meadowview. <laughs> if I want to go see some craziness, I, I would go over to Del Paso Heights. I'd see all the craziness and then get my fill and go home. I don't want to go to the store and see crazy people. I go to the store and see crazy people. That's no good. Waiting. I can't stand waiting, especially long lines in the middle of summer. And some of you are crazy enough that you're okay with waiting in a long line in the heat at the state fair, no less. It did, let, me, uh, let, me, let me fill you in. You're, st you're, you're paying to get parking, walking like three miles to get to Cal Expo, Standing in more lines so you can spend more money, but you're unhappy about it because it's not Disneyland. So <laughs> that's why I'm on, uh, not a fan of the state fair. Lines, waiting. We can't stand it. But Jesus had just finished telling his disciples, I want you to wait. I want you to wait. Now, our passage in John chapter 16, verse 7, has Jesus telling his disciples that something that's about to happen is best for them. I started to scratch my head and wonder, well, Jesus, you just told them that you're going to leave. You ever been a kid and you've been in that situation where you're like, is mom ever going to come back? That little kid syndrome, you know, where you walk into another, mom, are you still here? I, I picture the disciples in no less of a mindset that, Lord, you're telling us that it's best for you to leave. Our Lord and our Savior, who performed all these miracles, who transformed our lives, who picked us when nobody else picked us as underdogs, and handpicked us for world effectiveness, and now you're telling us it's best that you leave. 
Peter would be the first one to speak up and say, like my daughter would say, that don't make sense. Lord, how is it best that you leave? If you leave, that means that we're going to be sad. That means we're going to miss you. That means that the things that you did with us and for us and in our lives are not going to happen anymore. That also means that we're going to be sad a lot, like every day, because you're not here. You ever lose a loved one? I didn't know that sadness could exist until my mom passed away on, on that magnitude. I didn't know what sadness was until she was no longer around. And so I started to think the disciples are in the midst of a bomb of news being dropped on them that Jesus is telling them that I need to leave. It's best that I exit your life because if I don't, then he won't come. Who won't come? Your favorite artist? No. Your favorite celebrity? No. Your favorite politician? No. Your favorite fill in the black? No. The Holy Spirit, the advocate. And it's important that you understand who he is because many of us have heard of the Holy Spirit. How many have ever heard of the Holy Spirit before? Church folk, right? You heard of the Holy Spirit? Don't lie. You're in church today. Yeah heard of the Holy Spirit before, but many of us don't know who he is. A lot of us think he's an it. A lot of us think he's a substance. A lot of us think that he's a mythological creature. A lot of us think that he's just a breeze. A lot of us think that he's just a thing that we talk about in church just for fun to make things more colorful. But in fact, he's a person. Someone say he's a person. Who is he? Well, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are the Trinity, the three gods in one. And he's equal with God the Father and God the Son. But everything that the Holy Spirit does directs to Jesus. Someone say, Jesus is cool. A lot cooler than Phoenix in the summertime, that's for sure. And he directs everything that we do to Jesus. Everything that the Holy Spirit does is not to bring attention to himself. So if you go anywhere and people are just carrying on like mad people and, 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 and drawing attention to themselves, that's not the Holy Spirit doing that's somebody else is doing. What the Holy Spirit does is he says, y y Jesus, remember him? He's the one who died on the cross for you. I want to teach you how to be more like him. I want to teach you to make his plan clear for your life. Some of us have asked God for clarity. Have you asked the Holy Spirit for his clarity? Some of us are quick to Google and quick to ask others. But when's the last time we said, Holy Spirit, would you teach me? Make the Lord's will clear to me. Holy Spirit, would you direct my circumstances today? Holy Spirit, you're with me. But even beyond that, for us Jesus followers, you live inside of my life. Lord, my body, everything from head to toe belongs to you. This is a place where you reveal your glory. So God, would you reveal your glory to me and through me today? When's the last time we asked the Holy Spirit? The other thing that Jesus tells us is he's our guide. That means that he directs us, right? You ever had a tour guide before? I remember what, we went on this uh, trip to, I think it was a Monterey. We had the, man, this guy was amazing. Tour guide, all these cool things that I didn't even know about that city. And he was directing us and showing us the way to get to these really overlooked alleyways and passageways that we didn't even know existed. There are passageways and alleyways in your life that you have no idea exist, but the Holy Spirit's already in your future, and he wants to guide you if you only ask him. The other thing is he is our advocate. You ever been attacked before? Anyone ever accuse you of something? Anyone ever tell you off? Anybody ever cop a bad attitude with you? Anybody ever be that irregular other? You picture him right now, coworker relative, ex-friend, someone who you can't find on social media anymore because you got ghosted and canceled. That irregular other person, the Bible, Jesus also said that the Holy Spirit is our advocate. What that means is he's our defense attorney. He's our Johnny Cochran. So when these people come to accuse us of stuff and tell us terrible things, guess what the Holy Spirit does? He's, yeah, he steps in and he says, uh-uh. 
Nope. That's not who she is anymore. You're looking at an address that she no longer lives at. You're looking at the person she used to be. You're looking at he, who he used to be. You're looking at BC before Christ came into my child's life. That's who you're looking at. He defends us. He defends us. You don't have to defend yourself. The Holy Spirit defends you. Night and day, it says that Satan stands before the throne of God, condemning us, accusing us of all these things that we used to do before we encountered Christ in our lives. And the Holy Spirit says, nah. He's our defense. He's our present help, Jesus also says. Some of us not only need help, man, we need so much help that you can't even pronounce the whole word. We need help. We need so much help that we can't even pronounce that whole situation that we're in. We can't even begin to describe what we're going through. Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit is not just a helper, one of many, but he's the helper. He's the ultimate helper. Can, can you picture this, how cool it is to, have, to know somebody who can do anything, walk through walls, Unlimited power, unlimited wisdom, knows anything about everything, about everything, about everything, multiplied by millions of times, that makes, puts Google to shame, puts AI to shame, chat GBT and all the rest to shame, because he invented our minds. Somebody who not only is in all points in time of history, but also in all points of the world. So he's with you no matter where you are. He's with you even when you feel like you're all alone. He's there with you. The Holy Spirit is with you, but many times we overlook him, right? None of us like to be ignored. You know where you get that? You get that from God. Because he created you in his image. The Holy Spirit doesn't like to be ignored either. But how many times do we wake up and acknowledge him in our lives. See, I, I, I started to develop this habit. I didn't used to, but I started to develop this habit of when my eyes open in the morning, I say, good morning, Holy Spirit. Thank you for be living in my heart. Thank you for being with me. Guide me today. I'm going to need your strength. I'm going to need your patience. I'm going to need you, Lord. I'm going to need you to help me. I'm going to need you to guide me. I'm going to need you to teach me. I don't have it all together. Forgive me if I go to Google before I go to you today. Forgive me if I text a friend or call a friend or private message a friend and ask that person for help before I ask you for help today. Lord, would you convict me and help me to be a little bit more like Jesus today than I was yesterday? So when you look at me, you see a little bit more of a reflection of my Savior, Christ Jesus. Would you help me, Holy Spirit? And did you know that I have become more aware of his presence than ever? There are times that he makes me sensitive to what somebody is going through, and I didn't even have any inkling about what that person was going through. The old school term back in the day, they used to say, the Holy Spirit quickened me. He, he, he made me aware of the circumstances that were around me. God hasn't just saved you from. Someone say, God hasn't just saved me from. Many of us have a story where God interrupted our lives, came in and transformed our lives. How many have a story like that? Right, many of us do. And it's a beautiful story. And it's a story that you need to tell as often as you possibly can to as many different people as you possibly can for the rest of your life. And w even when you get tired of hearing your story, guess what's going to happen? One day you're going to be old and gray and you're not going to have the strength that you do now, the vitality. But you're going to be grateful because your kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids will have remembered that story that you told them. you got a story. But God hasn't just saved you from. Tell your neighbor, God hasn't just saved you from something. Come on, tell him like you mean it. You might as well just put some energy into it. You know what I mean? God hasn't just saved you from something. God has saved you for something. God has saved you for something. He saved you for a purpose. He saved you for a reason. He saved you to make a difference in this world, to leave your mark in this world. Why do you think the enemy has created so many things that distract us? I'm not saying social media and the tech companies are the enemy, but the enemy has used those things to distract us from God's ultimate plan and purpose for our lives. 
He gets us so off track by distracting us that we're no longer a threat to his kingdom. Because if we're so busy thumb, scrolling, 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 texting, then how are we going to be a threat and make a difference in this world against the enemy's kingdom? Many of us today feel like we are directionless. I will challenge you today. Take one hour out of your day and dedicate it to God. Take one hour of your day and stop worrying about what him, her, they, and the others are doing. Who cares? They're eating, they're sleeping, or they're working, or they're not working, or they're sharing little kitty cat videos. There's nothing more exciting than fulfilling God's purpose for your life, such to the point that you'll say, oh, really? Tell me more about um, what so-and-so is doing. I, I, I didn't even know. I haven't ha really had time for that stuff. I've been too engaged in doing God's business. Didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? I could not get caught up in those things because I had a purpose. I had a mission to fulfill. I had a mission to fulfill. God's got a mission for you to fulfill. In your workplace, in your family, in your neighborhood, wherever you go, God has selected you. And Jesus tells his disciples, look, it's best that I leave because if I don't, then he won't come and he won't help guide you. And we see this all throughout the New Testament about the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, there would be no book of Acts. Because Jesus said, don't do anything until he comes. Don't do anything until the very presence and power and glory of the Holy Spirit, who it all started with, Genesis 1-1. He was there hovering over the waters. He was there ready to meet us at our point of need. Even before Adam breathed his first breath, the Holy Spirit was already there. And here's the good news for you. The Holy Spirit's already there for you. You just have to open up the doormat. Jesus said in Revelation that he stands at the door and knocks. And he's talking to Christians. He's talking to Jesus followers, not people who are far from God. He stands at the door and knocks. He doesn't make weird faces and weird noises trying to get your attention. He doesn't jump and scream and shout and cry. He doesn't bang on the door until you come to it. He doesn't wait until your ring runs out of batteries so that way he can finally get your attention. He doesn't do the things that we think that weird people would do to get our attention. He gently, patiently waits. And like the gentleman that he is, stands with the, the glory that, that Jesus has, stands. He doesn't sit there because he's not a beggar. He's not going to beg you to let him in. But he's also a gentleman, so he's not going to pull out the angelic hosts and say, hey, guys, ram down that door. No, he's not going to do that. It says he waits. God waits. God waits for us. And for some of us, God's been waiting for us. You think that you've been waiting on God, but God's like, uh-uh, I've been waiting on you. We've been waiting on God to give us our next step, and God's like, I'm not, I'm not going to give you the next step until you take a step. I better say that again because that encouraged me. You're waiting for God to give you the next step, but God's waiting for you to take a step. He's waiting for you to allow his super to meet with your natural He's waiting for you to allow his super to meet with your natural. We get so caught up in our resources and in our situations and our circumstances. God's like, I'm going to give you the next step when you actually take a step. Some of us, we're living too safe. Some of us, our lives are so safe that we're like the boy in the bubble. Oh, no, I can't get a minute behind schedule. Oh, uh, if I encounter, uh, you know, a stranger, a stranger danger, and we're 45 years old. We're living too safe. The book of Acts and the work that God did through the apostles was anything but safe. You know what Jesus said? They're going to torture you. They're going to crucify you. 
They're going to murder you. They're going to take away your wife and your kids and do brutal things to you because you choose to not live a safe life. Some of us are asking God to show up, and he'll say, and he's saying, I'll show up when you do. It's like, where are you at, son, daughter? Where are you at? I love you, and I want what's best for you, but you're living way too safe. You're way too far into that comfort zone. God doesn't bless us in the comfort zone. The book of Acts is a book about stepping way outside of their comfort zone. When was the last time you did something daring, like that scared you, that terrified you, that you were like, oh, man, if I do that, then uh, bad things might happen. I might lose some friends. And no, I'm not saying do crimes. But I'm saying, when's the last time you had a holy conversation and stepped out of that bubble and said, you know what, I just want to know that God loves you. I just want to take a moment right now and say a word of prayer for you because I am a person of not just faith, but I am a person of the faith and the son of God. Not just of faith, but of the holy faith, the apostle Paul called it, the holy faith. I am a person of the holy faith. And as God's representative, I believe that God wants to move in your life, not just today, but for the rest of your life. So I'm going to say a word of prayer for you. Can you stop asking permission for the thing that God has been give, telling us to do? Can, we, can you show me in the book of Acts where any of the apostles or Jesus said, can I pretty please do this? Can you please allow me to do this? Can I just uh, candy coat it enough to where I won't be offensive to you? Jesus said, don't be offended just because you call yourself my follower. If you haven't offended somebody in a long time, then you're way too comfortable, my brother and my sister. you got to start offending some folks just because they know who you stand for. you got to start stepping out of that comfort zone and say, God, I know that you have way more for me than this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start starting some God conversations. I'm going to start letting them, I'm going to stop flying under the radar. And being that secret agent man and saying, well, maybe if I just say, maybe if I just do my Care Bear stare enough times, oh, just love everybody and everybody love me and let's all hug. And, you know, you have uh, positive things that are coming to you right now. And there's nothing but wonderful, exciting plans in your future. No, you tell them, get out of sin, fool. Some of us have been way too loving to the point that we have, that's not even a word, disgustified the love of God. Jesus said that you got to repent. But we disguise love as I'm not going to tell you the truth. No, I love you, so I'm going to tell you the truth. I love you, and even if you hate me for the rest of my life, I don't care, fool, because we're going to be in heaven worshiping Jesus together for all eternity, and that's what matters. God's waiting on us to take that step out of the boat. God's waiting for us to say, like Thomas, he sounded negative, but at the same time, at least he was willing to do something. He said, well, if that's the path that the Lord has chosen, let's all go and die with him then. Sometimes God's asking us not for more money, although, let me talk about that for a second. Why would you ask God to bless your money when you're giving him none of it? You're asking God to bless a pickpocket. You're taking money out of God's pocket over here, and you're saying, God, can you put money in the other pocket? He's like, no, I'm not going to do that because you already know what to do. Some of us, God's been telling us, hey, I want to be first in your financial life. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And once you do, I'm going to come through in a way that's going to blow your mind. That's going to blow your mind. But you question and you hem and you haw. You're like, oh, Lord, I don't know. You know, carry the one. And, you know, I don't know if it's going to work out. He's like, no, you don't carry any numbers because my power is so much greater than your mathematical equations could ever be. I'll come through when you come through. 
I'm waiting for you to take that step. And then I'm going to meet you there in such a supernatural way that your 90% left over is going to be more like 190% because of all the cool stuff that I'm going to do on your behalf. Some of us were so, trying so hard to change other people that we're worn out by the end of the day. Can I tell you something? Your job is not to change anybody. If you spent half as much time and energy on letting God change you, then people would say, wow, look at that. There is a God, and he does exist in your life. So what must I do to be saved? Some of us are trying so hard to get somebody to speak kindly and act normally and have manners. Now, let me clarify this. If it's your kids and they're under 18 years old, then you teach them good manners and you teach them good habits. But if they're over 18 years old, then you stop trying so hard. Oh, and if they're over 18 years old and have no job and are not paying rent, kick them out. <laughs> oh, but that's so cruel. Is it though? Is it? Is that cruel or is that love? What would our parents or grandparents have done if we were just living there rent-free, no job, no prospects? Kick us out? Then how is it love to not teach someone how to grow up? We're facing this epidemic of Peter Panism as I get ready to wind down in about 45 minutes. No, I'm just kidding. I'll get rid of <laughs> Where young people refuse to grow up where young people refuse to, let me talk about men, because women are usually far ahead, so I'm going to let you guys off the hook today, okay? Where it used to be in our country that the rite of passage for a young man was that he get married. Don't live with that chick if you're not married to her. You better put a ring on it. Even Beyonce said, if you like it, you should have put a ring on it. And she's not even saved. You better put a ring on that. Because if you are abusing God's daughter now, then how much more are you going to abuse her later? And if you've got a daughter and you're a princess, you, be, you, you better demand that that dude put a ring on it. Today, go, go get a Cracker Jack box, little ring in it, $1.50. Oh, I don't have money. Oh, you, well, you got money to go to the state fair. You got money to buy your favorite video game. You got money to buy some new shoes. If he's not willing to put a ring in it, he don't love you. Find somebody else. Got, some, got someone better for you. There's a lot of single dudes in the world. You might have to just look a little bit older. Maybe you've been looking for boys and you've been looking for a man. A man. Some of us, he's been telling us it's time for us to fulfill our God-given potential. You've been sitting on your potential for too long. You've been sitting on your potential for too long. And you know the thing that irks me? I'm, I'm just a real kind of person, okay? If you and I were having a conversation, I can't help but tell the truth in a loving way, even if sometimes it hurts your feelings, because someone told me one time, you know, my friend stabbed you in the front. Enemy stab you in the back. I'd rather be your true friend and you know where I stand and I love you and I'm willing to tell you the truth than to go behind your back and tell everybody and their mom about what I think about you. There's some of us, we've been sitting on our potential for so long that there's flies swirling around our potential. And you know the thing that irks me about potential is it's just potential. In science, there's two types of energy. There's potential energy. That means that it, it's like this room that's dark, right? When the light switch is not flipped on, that's potential energy. It's, it, it's got the opportunity to provide light to this room, but the switch hasn't been flipped on yet. Kinetic energy is when the light switch has been flipped on and the room is illuminated. The electricity is flowing. And it's providing light to everybody who enters this room. It's providing a nice, cool room, air-conditioned room to everybody who comes in here instead of walking in and it's like 125 degrees in here. 
I have a problem with potential because too many people say that they've got it, but that it just sits there unused. It's like that, that brand new fill in your fill in your favorite car. I don't know what, what's out there, uh, Corvette, uh, Camaro, what, whatever it is. It's like you've got this brand new car, right? You got the keys. You shine it. You polish it. You wax it every day. People come over and you say, oh, check out my brand new Corvette. Isn't it beautiful? But they never, never drive it. It just sits there on your, on your driveway. And you show it off, take pictures, post selfies with it, but never drive it. Some of us, we've been taking selfies with our potential and we've not tapped into it. And God is saying, I'm ready for you to make a difference. Some of us, the enemy has been pulling out all these distractions because he is so terrified of what will happen when you tap in to God's potential for your life. Some of us, we've just been letting the enemy punk us left and right. And God's like, I've given you the weapons of your warfare, which are not of this world, but are mighty in God for pulling down the enemy's strongholds. And all you got to do is step into it. Step in, my friend. Step into it. If you need someone to help you, I'll help you. I love nothing more than to sit with somebody who is willing to reach their full potential. I have been accused of believing too much in people. You might say, well, it's better than the alternative, right? Than not believing in them at all. And I believe that I'm looking at heads of departments, heads of education. I believe that you should be the lead litigator if you're an attorney. I believe that I'm looking at lead doctors. I believe I'm looking at pastors, evangelists, and missionaries. I believe that you should be managing that job, that you've been held back for too long and overlooked, and now it's your time. I believe I'm looking at world-changing moms and dads. Man, you're going to raise up some kids who just demolish the kingdom of darkness. I believe that I'm looking at some young people, some teenagers, some men and women who are like, I'm not going to let the enemy have his way any longer. I'm going to step into my true potential, and I'm going to make a difference in this world for Jesus. I believe I'm looking at some people who you have so much to look forward to that you need to take some time with you a pen, a Bible, and a journal, and say, God, give it to me. God, give me that download. God, what have you got for me? God, I'm turning off the phone. I'm putting the devices away. Sleep. I'm listening. And you start to get this heavenly download. You're like, what? Wow. Oh. Whoa. Oh, man. And then you start writing and writing and writing. And you might be there for an hour. You might be there for two hours. You might be there for five or six hours. I'm going to challenge, in closing, I'm going to challenge every single one of us that this week, that we bombard the gates of heaven. Because we've tried and we pulled out all the stops, but we haven't asked the Holy Spirit to come into the picture. I'm going to challenge you this week that you will bombard the gates of heaven and say, Lord, wreck this world for you. God, turn this world upside down and right side up because I know that my country is going to hell in a handbasket, but I'm not going to let that happen. As long as I have breath in my lungs, Lord, come through. Come through. Come through, God. Come through. I believe there's some people like that in the house. And if that's you, I just want you to stand today. I want you to stand today. And just start bombarding the gates of heaven today. Some of us, we need prayer for different situations. If I can have some prayer leaders come and help me. Or if you'd like to just spend a moment in God's presence, then just come to these altars and pour out your heart to God. You might not even know what to say, and that's okay. That's totally fine because God knows exactly what is on your mind. God knows exactly what is going on in your life. You're no stranger to him. He's been paying attention to you. And yes, he has heard your prayer. And yes, he is 
noticing you. And yes, he is moving on your behalf, but he's asking you to take that step of obedience so that way he can move the way that he wants to in your life and perform the transformation that he's been wanting to in your life. If you need prayer for any reason, then step forward to these altars and let someone pray with you. If you want to step out into the aisle, if you want to find a place here at the front, then go ahead and do that today. And we're going to see God do some extraordinary things. And maybe you need to take that first step and receive Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior. If you need to do so, then I want you to go ahead and just step out of your seat. Talk to one of our prayer leaders and say, would you just lead me in that prayer? I want to commit my life to Christ. And let's make this, let's, let's make this a place where the Holy Spirit can reveal his plan, his power, and his purpose to us today as we sing this song. Lord, we open our hearts to you. Lord, we invite you. Lord, we are tired of the things that you've not been able to do because we have not taken those steps that you wanted us to take. And God, we're here. God, we're here. God, we're pouring out our hearts before you because we know that you have such wonderful plans for our individual lives, for our families, for our country. God, you, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Not just in this place or in this moment, but Lord, we welcome you into our circumstances. Lord, we welcome you into our families. Lord, we welcome you into our hopes and our dreams. Lord, we welcome you. Lord, would you breathe upon those circumstances? Would you breathe upon those circumstances? Some of us are facing challenges galore. And Lord, we really need you to breathe upon those situations because we don't know. We don't know how they're going to turn out, but we trust them to you. We don't know what to do, Lord, but our eyes are on you today. Our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you, oh, wonderful, magnificent God ever-present help in time of trouble, we welcome you right now. Some of us are praying and believing you to do a miracle in our bodies. Lord, zap that sickness in the name of Jesus. Zap that sickness. Zap that sickness. The enemy thought that he had your people against the ropes. Zap that sickness. But little did they know, little did he know that you're the healer. You're the great physician. Would you zap illnesses, God? that confound doctors and medical experts left and right that can rise up and say, the Lord is my healer. I will not be afraid. Lord, there's some of us who are praying for our kids and we lift up every child. We lift up every teenager to you. God, the enemy has tried, tried to target our kids with confusion gender confusion, purpose confusion, confusion and distraction of all kinds and sizes, but we won't allow it because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Lord, may our families be a beacon this week and all weeks in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, wherever we find ourselves, Lord, that the enemy would know that there is a God and he is alive and well in your people of TFH Natomas. We give it over to you, God. We give it over to you. And I pray for your people, Lord, that you would guard them, that you would guard your precious people against every work of the enemy. We say claim to every work of darkness that you have no authority over the people of God. These are the Lord's sons and daughters and they have been claimed for his purpose and his potential. And today we unleash heaven upon their lives and upon their circumstances. Lord, we believe that they will step out of their comfort zone and into the territory that you call them to occupy, the influence and impact that you have called them to have. Holy
Holy Spirit, we welcome you. And Lord, we thank you. And Lord, we glorify you because you are great and awesome and worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Worthy is your name, Lord. Worthy is your name. Glorious are you, God. Come on, let's sing that song this morning. Hey, TFH family, we are so glad you were able to join us for our online experience. We want to stay connected with you, and one way you can do that is to follow us on all socials at TFH in Columbus. Also, if you've never been to our Sunday services, I encourage you to come to our 10.30 a.m. services every Sunday. God bless.